Richard Solomon, this is Taking Care of Business, and I am honored to have Kazan Sultan with me. Uh, if, if you probably know Kazan because his entire music career is the soundtrack of our lives. <laughs> uh, if you go back to Bad Out of Hell, he was there. If you go to Todd Rundgren's Utopia, he was there. Joan Jett, uh, uh, currently a solo artist, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, and in the past, The New Cars. His resume is extensive. But most importantly, one of the things that I truly admire and respect about Chasm Sultan at ChasmSultan.com is that when you see him play solo, and he's there either with just a piano or an acoustic guitar, you see the genuine emotion and authenticity in the music that you, just, you don't really see everywhere else. And of course, he has incredible talent, uh, especially <laughs> reflected in his new album called Three, where he plays the, the bass, the guitar, the mandolin, the piano... And the organ. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. so, so welcome to the show. Thank you for the opportunity to, to have some time with us here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I was a big fan. I have a lot of the old Utopia albums, and I, I listened to a lot of Three in pre-production. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Three, because that's sort of the new, current, exciting uh, uh, project. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things I saw was that you had all your fans – submit photos in order to make a montage bigger photo. Yeah. Tell me uh, about that. That was really cool. <laughs> well, you know, these days, um, the, way the, the way the music industry is, has evolved, um, it, there's not a lot of uh, clamoring for um, uh, middle-aged artists, I guess is what you want to call it. Uh, it's hard to get a record deal. Let me just say, let me put it that way. It's it's difficult to get a record deal these days. So what you have to do is you have to you have to try to fund a record by you know by yourself. And the best way to start to do that is to go to the people who have been loyal, the supporters who've been who've followed you, who've come to the shows, bought the records in the past, and uh, and ask them for help. You know, it's uh, it, it's a it's a big thing to ask for help. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it. And so that's exactly what I did in order to start the record. Rather than run a Kickstarter campaign or a, a crowdfunding or a kick finisher or whatever they do these days, um, I thought it might be nice to just start this little groundswell of uh, send in uh, a few dollars. And for that, I will give you uh, your picture will be on the cover of my record. Um, uh, you'll get you'll get a CD. You'll get a poster that that's a bit larger than just a CD, so you can actually see where you are on the. Because uh, we have to shrink the pictures down, um, and I will enter you in a contest uh, to for, to have me play at uh, at your house. Wow, that now that you can't shake. You know that's great. That is. So just... I got about I got about three hundred and fifty submissions, and uh, and so out of those three hundred and fifty people, I'll I'll pick a couple of three people, and I'll go play it there in the living room. Wow. Well, maybe maybe everybody at the station will kick in. We'll get a bunch of CDs, and then maybe you can come to the station and play live. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love to. See, that would be great. How how long was this project in the making? Because I see from your liner notes, which are really cool and extensive that it kind of had its genesis all the way back in 2006 um I, I you know i'm constantly writing songs uh i'm constantly writing material and uh and you know songs in various stages of of uh completion um and everyone every so often i'll say you know what it's time to uh finish a song and and record it and so i'll do that i don't know i, I don't know that it was 2006 um there might have been a couple of tracks that were recorded um you know prior to my decision to do another solo record um 
but the actual uh, recording of this record uh, in 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 the state that it in the form that it is now didn't really start until 2010, when I had made the decision to uh, to put a, a, a collection of songs together. What was what was sort of the the spark that that ignited this process? I. Um, uh, well, it, 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 like everything, you know, it starts with an idea, and and I had an idea that maybe it was time to do another so, solo record. It had been ten years since my last one, um, so I didn't. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't like I'm putting out a record every eighteen months like we used to do in the seventies and eighties, uh, and and some of the nineties too as well. Uh, so I, I just thought it was time that. Uh, I've been doing live shows. I've been playing for uh, for my fans and for audiences <clears throat> on the East Coast and the Midwest, and one or two uh, shows on the West Coast. Uh, and I just thought it was time to do another record. So I was on the road with Meatloaf at the time in 2009, actually. Uh, and, um, and I went over to my, I have a writing partner who lives, <coughs> excuse me, who lives in London and, uh, we've written some songs, uh, over the years together, some really, what I think are really good songs. Is that Phil? Yes. Ah, let's talk, <laughs> Phil talk, talk, yeah, you gotta talk about that. <clears throat> so every time I'm, I'm in England, I have a little bit of time off, you know, a day here, a day there. Uh, I give Phil a call and ask if he's uh, if he's got any free time. Would he like to write some songs? And this particular time, uh, I knew that I wanted to start another record. So I went over to Phil's house and I said, "Listen, I'm I'm thinking of starting a new record." He says, "Oh, another Chasm record. Oh, it's about time." <laughs> and uh, and we sat down and we wrote the first song for the record which was fell in love for the last time, which actually happens to open the record. Um, and it just was a series of, uh, you know, of like, uh, throwing ideas back and forth, you know, well, what do you, you know, what kind of vibe do you want on the record? What's the, what's the, uh, uh, what's the theme of the record? And I don't, I don't really do any of that stuff. You know, it's, uh, it's just a, co a collection of what I hope is really good songs. Um, and uh, and that's how it started, and that started with that song, and that song was completed uh, within six months, six eight months, something like that. Um, and then it was uh, it was a question of well, that song was the benchmark, uh, and and then it was getting every song after that to sound as good, to be as good lyrically, me melodically, if not better than that. Um, so it was a process, and uh, which, which it started off very, very, very slowly. Um, but in, in, for whatever reason, it was it, it, the, the first song was, in my opinion, the first song was so good that each successive song after that had to be just as good, if not better. And that really kind of made me work really hard. So you set a really high mark. Yeah, yeah. Now. This song in your li liner notes say that it's it's it says imagine seeing someone you know that you found the love of your life and that you really don't have to like fall in love again. Right. So my question is, does this song kind of pick up from like "Set Me Free"? <laughs> well, "Set Me Free" was uh, was the 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 big hit single for Utopia, if you want to call it that. Um, it was a top thirty hit, uh, actually top twenty. Um, for a minute uh, back in when it came out. And Set Me Free was not about uh, Girl Boy. It was about, uh, I was on a record, I was signed to to Bearsville Records, and uh, and I wanted to do a solo. I desperately wanted to do my first solo record, and Bearsville Records did not think that I was ready to do a, a solo record. They thought that I still needed to mature as an artist, as a songwriter. And and I said, look, if you you know if you don't want to do this, then I'm going to go somewhere else and you know find somebody who does want to do it. Uh, and they wouldn't let me out of the contract. 
Um, so set me free is about <laughs> getting getting let <laughs> released from a recording contract. See, it's interesting because when I when I used to listen to um, Adventures in Utopia when when it first came out, I actually thought it was about a relationship. Yeah. But I did notice that in the liner notes of uh, Utopia's uh, Oblivion POV and some trivia, they talked about that, but I, I didn't realize that until like. You know this interview. <laughs> it was about breaking up with a, but I, I, it worked so well in relations because it's really about a relationship not really working out. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Right. Now you have this great song here. You sets the mark. And then what else happened? Uh, you know, how did it start rolling out? What was the, the process? And and who were all these great musicians and people you collaborated with besides Phil? Well, you know, the rest of the record and and the songs that came uh that came after um were you know, piecemeal together over the course of the next three and a half years, four years almost. Um I had some personal stuff go on in my life that that kind of threw a, a little uh wrench in in my work uh schedule and I took a uh, had to take a year off um to take care of my family. Um, but other than that, um, it was just a question of, uh, you know, of, of nose to the grindstone. Let's see, what do I have? What ideas do I have? What ideas are good enough to start trying to finish? Um, what ideas do I not want to concentrate on? And, uh, and then, um, I just sat down and, and really started recording all the basic tracks other than the stuff that I did with Phil, which was recorded in London. Um, so I, I, there was a, a long process of, of doing stuff because I do everything by myself, uh, in my, in my home studio. Uh, it, it was, it was extremely tedious, but, you know, with each successive, uh, day and track being, being, you know, created, I, I was more and more um, determined to make it a, a really, really good record. Not that my prior records weren't good. It was just that I, I, I felt that uh, I was finally kind of coming into my own as a songwriter, lyricist, melodist, melodicist. And um, I could really, instead of just like, you know, a spurt of like one or two okay songs or good songs, um, I wanted to put together a collection of really good songs, 11 really, really good songs. So you, so you feel like you're firing on all cylinders this time? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't call it that. I, I wouldn't because that, to me, that connotates, you know, like something that you put together and, and it comes out right away, you know. It's like it's, you're done with it in a few months, maybe a year. This was a slow burn. This was, uh, this was like, you know, a si- more of a simmer than, <laughs> than, uh, than firing on all cylinders. But, but and maybe in some ways it's, that gives you the luxury of sort of real perspective that you don't get when you're doing something maybe at a faster pace? Um, I think so. You, you know, I, th- I, I took my time with everything. And to answer the second part of your question, I, uh, I made a conscious decision somewhere maybe um, in the second year of working on the record that I wasn't going to do everything myself, that I was going to have other musicians on the record. Um, I rarely had done that in the past. I've, I, I've just done everything by myself. And I think that that really kind of limited me in terms of, uh, expanding the musical horizon of each individual song. So I, you know, I've come in contact. I have some, uh, some amazing friends in the music business and peers and people that I, I admire and look up to. And I said, you know what, why not have them play on the record? So these days, it's so much easier to to accomplish that uh, with the internet and file transfers and uh, MP3s, and you know people have studios in their house; they don't have to go rent a hundred and a hundred dollar an hour studios. Um, and I don't have to fly, say, Andy Timmons in from from Texas to play on a track. You know, I could just send him. Uh, I can send him a track and say, throw some guitars on it, and let's see where we go from there. Nice. And that's that's uh, uh, that's how that that whole process happened. And it it was so good that you know wound up that I have like fifteen other musicians on this record. Wow. 
This is Richard Salmon. You're listening to Taking Care of Business. My very special guest is Kazim Sultan and uh, KazimSultan.com. Before we take a quick break, you want to tell us uh, your contact information, like you know, Facebook, Twitter, so the fans can really connect with you? Yeah, sure. I, uh, Facebook, I have a band page on Facebook that's Kazim Sultan, uh, S-U-L-T-O-N. And uh, the best uh, place to get information about me is on my website, uh, is KasimSultan.com. And I have a Twitter that I, I, I like to, you know, uh, I, I'm not the kind, of, the, the kind of guy that just sends out random Twitters, <laughs> even though it sounds so silly. Um, but I do uh, update people on what I'm doing pretty, pretty regularly. And where you're Twitter. performing. And where I'm performing. So that's K Sultan, I believe, on Twitter. All right. So this is Richard Salmon. We'll be right back right after this break. Keep it locked in. We'll see you right back. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. My very, very special guest is Kazim Sultan. We're talking about his really cool new album called Three. I guess that was entitled Three because it's the third solo album. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's some other uh, some other reasons why I, I decided to name the record Three. Three. The number three is an important number in my life. Uh, it's also like, you know, body, mind, and spirit. Um, uh, uh, thought, word, deed, um, uh, the Holy Trinity. Not that I'm very religious, but um, so three is uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Not the band, but uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why I, I chose to to put three. But the main reason was because it, it is my my third proper solo record. Wow! Um, I saw the video for Clocks All Stopped. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that because. Uh, first of all, has the production of videos changed a lot since the heyday of, say, MTV and VH1 and the 70s and 80s? Well, I mean, it's just it's it's the same as uh, as record making. Uh, you know, it's like we shot that video. Ninety nine percent of that clocks all stop video was shot on an iPhone. Really? Yeah. You'd never know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, you see, there you go. I'm, uh, so uh, you, you wouldn't know it. Uh, have there, there are so many records out there that are just done on you know somebody's little home computer with GarageBand or a little Pro Tools rig, you know that, and they don't have a million dollars worth of outboard gear or studios, you know, or uh, 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 isolation boots or anything like that, and and they make damn good records, you know. So that's just the that's just the nature of the beast right now. That's just the way things things are. Is, in terms of the way music is made and played, how do you feel about sort of the genesis of the way music started in say say the seventies, uh, all the way up till now, and what you see in the future of music? In, in some ways, uh, radio has really changed. And I'm, I, you know, I remember you mentioned in one of your interviews about WNEW, and I was a big fan of that station because mm -hmm. I thought they were a great station. And, that format and the format of really maybe like what we're doing right now where we're really getting in depth and talking about an album and mm -hmm. an artist and a, a great career, it's really not so much on the radio as much as it used to be. It's really it's kind of being – it's lost. It's being lost and you don't even see it that much even on alternatives to radio like YouTube, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, what, you, what your question is, but uh, – it's really it's how how music playing and 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 getting airplay and connecting your music with new fans has changed from maybe the 1970s until today, and what you see on the horizon. Well, you know, again, it's the, the someone I, I was having a conversation with somebody not too long ago, and um, he described the music business 
to me today as the wild, wild west. It's just there are no rules anymore, you know. It's like every man for himself, you know. It's just like guns ablaze, and, you know, it's like you're riding around, circle the wagons, and hope for the best. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, it's, uh, it's guerrilla marketing, you know. It's getting out there. It's... It, it's um, it, giving people access to stuff that that you know, twenty years ago they never would have had access to. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, in in nineteen eighty nineteen eighty, would you have ever done a meet and greet? You know, no. Uh, I don't. I don't think there were meet and greets in nineteen eighty. Uh, you, you said hello to fans, but fans didn't pay an extra three hundred dollars to come backstage and shake your hand. You know, uh, so there's all these other ways to to uh, to monetize, you know, playing music uh, because you don't really make any money selling records these days. It's just it's just the way it is. Not not everybody sells a million records and hardly anybody sells half a million records. Uh, you know, a band like Aerosmith that's used to selling millions and millions and millions of records sells 100,000 records now, you know. Same with John Bon Jovi. It's the, it's the same exact thing. So how many Beyonce's are there? How many Lady Gaga's are there? How many Katy Perry's are there? Um, you know, uh, how many Bruno Mars are there? They're, they're very, very few and far between. And I think that that what the indicator is, is that, you know, it's... The, all that stuff that I just mentioned is it, this, this is a, a this is a youth oriented society. Everything is geared towards youth, and if you're not you know 25 years old, um, you, you're not going to play to to 15 year olds, you know, or 16 year olds who 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 come to who buy anything, you know, who buy anything from from One Direction or. Uh, uh, or the whatever other band you want to you want to name, um, so so everything has shifted. Yeah, you know, ev- everything is has has shifted, and it, it, the onus is on the individual artist to make himself special in in ways that he didn't have to do that before. You know, um, house concerts, um, uh, 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 live shows, uh, stage it. You know, the live uh, internet con. Uh, concerts um there's a there's a a ton of ways to get your music out there but the audience has shrunk you know the audience is is very very um specific these days um you know it's that's just the way it is and where is it going i like to think that uh, that eventually things will settle down eventually you know things will it'll, it'll settle into some normalcy but right now it's it, it's basically anything goes for instance i i can't get my record played on triple a radio and i don't know if your audience knows about triple a radio or or hot ac or adult contemporary or you, you know any of these corporate stations that that are run by uh clear channel or uh any one of a you know a handful of huge media outlets they just won't play it you know and if i had a half a million dollars to uh to to make them play it maybe that would be a different story but so you have to where is it used to be you get your record on the radio and then you you sell a bunch and then you go out and tour where the record is strong um it's just not like that anymore you know it's just it's it's like I said before. It's guerrilla marketing. It's just trying to reach as many people as you possibly can with the with the with the smallest budget <laughs> that you can imagine. Does that does that put a lot of pressure on having to tour much more? Um, well, it's that's that's where you you get your message out now. That's that's where you build your audience from the ground up. Is is by playing. Uh, I guess you could call it touring. I don't. I don't know. My my definition of touring is a nice bus. You know, with the band and a bus following it with the crew, and then a semi trailer with all your equipment in it. Um, that doesn't that doesn't happen a lot these days. It, so, it certainly happens for for uh, for other people, but for me, it's about you know loading up my car and going to Philadelphia to play the Tin Angel, you know. And I'm happy with that. I'm okay with that. That's fine. 
Uh, and that's how that's how you 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 get your message out. That's how you get your you you build your audience, and uh, and hopefully one day you know you uh, you have a bus or you're you know you have a band. It's for me you know a, a band is cost prohibitive, uh, and and it's 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 really a shame that that most of this conversation is has been about money. But really, at the end of the day, it, 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 it's called the music business. As much as I don't like the, you know, to be in a any one business, but it is a business. Well, you need to pay for the equipment, for the gas in the car, and you know, yeah. the recording equipment. You know, I think your song "The Traveler" is about touring. Cause yeah. Talk about I, that. So let's let's talk about how that kind of fits into this whole discussion. Well, you know, uh, there was uh, uh, there was a, uh, a, a couple of four or five years where I was I was playing. Um, I was doing a, a lot more solo shows, and um, I was I was driving myself. You know, I was I, I I would get in my car and drive to Cleveland, play a show in Cleveland. Uh, the next day, I would drive to Chicago. The day after that, I would uh, play a show in Chicago, and then maybe on the way back, I'd uh, I'd hit Columbus or Cincinnati or uh, even Boston, for that matter. And I, you know, I do fifteen hundred miles in a week, um, on my, you know, in my car by myself. Um, so that's where the traveler comes in, you know, it's like, I, I thought about it and I'm like, you know, I, 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 I drive. That's what I, I, I just travel for a living. You know, that's when, when, when somebody these days who doesn't know me, um, if I'm at a party or something like that, and I, I meet somebody who doesn't know me, not familiar with my, what I do for a living or my career, uh, and they ask me what I do. I say I travel for a living because really, that's when you think about it. It's like I'll I'll travel for for twenty four hours to work for an hour and a half. Well, yeah, I, I could I could kind of relate to that a little bit because as as lawyers, a lot of times we drive all the way to court, wait there, sit in the courtroom for two yeah. hours, only for a two minute transaction. <laughs> yeah. then, you know, all right, case adjourned. Come back in three months, and you're like, your client's like. That it, this was five hours, and it's sort of like, well, yeah, that's that's well, sort of five, the way it, yeah, it's five billable hours at least. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily <laughs> bill all five. But, okay, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> in some ways, I guess the, one of the last few ways to see the world is to do it kind of like what you're doing, which is mm-hmm. sort of traveling around. There, there must be some, I guess, there must be some kind of juxtaposition between like Bob Seger's turn the page experience of the road and. And, and seeing all of the U.S. out there and, and, and meeting all the people and, and seeing historic places and sites. Yeah, you know, it, it's really not like that for me. Um, it's, it's not, a, it, it's not a, 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 a vacation road trip. It's like get to where you're going so, you know, so you can play your show and then get to the next place. It's... Uh, I I enjoy the scenery, uh, and I certainly enjoy the people that I come in contact with. But I'm not I'm not there to uh, to to have a vacation. You know, I'm not there to to. Um, I don't concentrate on the traveling. I concentrate on the destination. When you when you're in the car for all those hours. Do you listen to music, or do you kind of get on the phone, or a little bit of a little bit of both? A little bit of both. I mean, I'm not on the phone a lot in the car, I, uh, unless I have to be. Um, I listen to a lot of talk radio. I listen to a lot of NPR, um, and uh, you know, um, every once in a while, I'll uh, you know, I'll I'll look for something that's that's halfway interesting. Radio these days is, you know, music radio anyway is. It's one or the other. It's either classic rock, or uh, or, or they're playing ta- uh, Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. <laughs> you know? no, I, I agree. One of the one of the things that's the most frustrating is that the playlists are so tight yeah. that you would think that some of the more famous bands who may have been around between twenty five and fifty years only really produced like three songs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, that's you know. That's where you know XM comes in, Sirius XM, and you know Deep Tracks, and 
and stuff where they they aren't restricted to you know to a a, a forty song playlist. You know, um, they can pretty much go where they want to go. And thank God for Sirius, they're playing my record. And, and by the way, we we will be playing your record. Well, I really appreciate and, that, and I will make sure that in 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 some of our segments we'll do some things where we talk about uh, your upcoming concerts, and we'll certainly mm-hmm. make sure that some of the songs, especially your uh, your song "Fell in Love for the Last Time," I'll make sure that that's uh, put on our playlist. Thanks. I I know people at the station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so before we move on to other topics, I, um, where was Clocks All Stop filmed? I was curious about that. Uh, most of it was filmed at uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I, well, I knew it was a cemetery, and, and to be honest, most of the time you don't see cemeteries. No, <laughs> in, you don't. In music videos. <laughs> it's not really what you want to have in a video, <laughs> is it? Maybe, maybe Ozzy Osbourne, but I, you know, it wasn't really. You know, and I'm like, yeah, and it's like, wow, because it, it was definitely. I said, this has got to be one of the more well-known sort of mausoleum type places, mm-hmm. but I couldn't, I, I couldn't place it because it, it didn't look familiar, especially because you had the way, the way you did it, it was the, the imagery. It, it was sort of like, yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like a soft, yeah, uh, like a soft like thing on the lens to soften up the image. So you couldn't really see everything with clarity because you didn't really want that. You wanted the more of the aura as opposed to the specificity. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in in any other case, it might not have been the proper venue for a video, but I think that uh, in this in this particular instance, it it works. Um, and besides the fact, I got to be around Betty Davis and Liberace and uh, Stan Laurel and Slim Whitman. And, I mean, and Hank Williams. <laughs> what better what better place could you be? And not only that, but you know, speaking of money, they're all still collecting royalties. <laughs> Absolutely, God bless. In fact, uh, there's like a Forbes list of the most profitable uh, people who are no longer alive, and it, it's kind of amazing. How I think, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, John Lennon and Elvis are, are pretty high up on that list. Well, I actually did a radio show from Memphis where we, I went to Graceland and did a whole little tour, and you can see that people still come there. It's still a tremendous interest in his music. And, and speaking of XM, you know, the Elvis channel really does a lot to promote sort of all of the stories behind the scenes with Elvis, especially, you know, George, George Klein show, uh, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So I, I, I mean, I think I'm one of the last people in radio who still loves – Sort of talking to people like you, t- getting into into the music. Uh, you know, sadly, Rockline, which was on the air for over thirty three and a half years, with uh, hosted by Bob Coburn, just went off the air. Wow, uh, that's that a was, shame. That, you know, I, I once stayed in the same hotel as Elvis. No kidding. That's yeah. how that happened. Well, we were playing the same place. Uh, it was a Utopia tour, and. Um, I think we were there uh, either the night before or two days before he was he was due to be uh, at the at the venue, and um, we was we stayed at the same hotel. Uh, he was uh, he was on one floor and we were on another. It was it was wild. I mean, I I wish that I would have been a little bit more of an Elvis fan back then. Uh, I might have made some kind of attempt to. Uh, to, to get up to his floor, but I don't think that would have been possible anyway. Um, yeah, but it, that was that was pretty cool. Uh, Elvis is in the building. Wow. <laughs> Instead of Elvis has left the building. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, Elvis has left the building with Kazma Sultan. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. When, when you toured with all the different other artists that you did, like, say, the Tubes and, and other headliners, were there ever opportunities where you just sort of jumped on stage impromptu and started playing with other bands, just you know, unscripted and just sort of like, ah, what, what the hey? We uh, we did a tour together, Utopia and um, the Tubes. It was the it was the kind of the swan song tour for both bands, and uh, we played Radio City. Uh, bo- both bands played Radio City Music Hall. Or, or great venue, it, great venue. Or, or was it the Tubes that played Radio City, and I just went to see them? I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. Uh, but I just got up on stage and sang uh, She's a Beauty with the Tubes. That, you know, um, There's a couple of other times during my, over my career that I hopped up on stage. I think one was Back to the Bars, where Todd was playing at the Roxy in Los Angeles. Uh, 
And uh, there was about 18 other people on stage, and I was sandwiched between Stevie Nicks and Shaka Khan. Um, that was pretty cool. Wow. Uh, it, it, do you do you think there's a book in you about some of the great moments in rock and roll that you that you? <laughs> you know, you are the you are like the the sixth person in the last week has said, you know, you really need to write a book. I, you know, I, and I, and my answer is always the same. I I, I don't know that. Anybody besides my mom would want to read it, you know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I know you wrote a, a song about the paparazzi and the, it called "15 Minutes." Yeah, but but this isn't really for that. This is really sort of you have all these cool stories and experiences, and I think people would love to kind of travel back in time with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I I might have a book in me. I, I don't. I'm I'm busy doing other stuff, you know, <laughs> right well, now. Well, if you ever want, we'll do an audio book. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. This is Richard Solomon. The show is Taking Care of Business. Our website is tcbradio.com. We are on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash tcbradio WCWP. We are rocking with Chasm Sultan. We will be back. But before we leave, jot down chasmsultan.com and you can check out all of the great things that's going on with uh, his touring, his uh, music releases, and all the events that are going on. We'll be right back. Hang in. What I really need Some kind of affection All right, Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. I am with Chasm Sultan. Every radio show host has a secret list of all kinds of people they would love to either meet or get get an opportunity to talk to. And Chasm Sultan was actually one of the people on my list, honestly and truly. Wow, Uh, that's really a compliment. Thank you. When I was in the State University of New York at Binghamton, um, my friend and roommate, uh, Jeff, Jeff Pines, uh, handed me a copy of Adventures in Utopia. Uh-huh. And he said, you've got to listen to this. <laughs> and it was, it just blew me away. The whole album was just great from beginning to end. I probably, I still have my vinyl copy. Uh, I probably wore it out. I, of course, have the CD copy. <laughs> uh-huh. And um, I'd love to just talk to you a, a little bit about that. Uh, a lot of the people that I actually uh, went to school with in Binghamton were actually huge Utopia fans, including some of the people on my floor. Uh, in fact, I think one of your cousins was wearing like a Utopia shirt. And someone said, hey, uh, and they said, oh, yeah, I'm Chasm Sultan, uh, Chasm Sultan's cousin. Uh And so, you know, so I don't know who that was, but it it shows you how memorable these things were way back in the day. When when you're semi-famous, you have a lot of cousins, (laughs) all of a sudden. (laughs) I I know in an interview, you you were telling a really funny story. I think this is an interview you did in Akron where um, you were talking about you, you took your son somewhere and someone said to your son, Hey, do you know you, ha- you have a fa- famous dad? And then your son said something like, he's famous? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, yeah, that's do, pretty much true. <laughs> do, do, do your kids listen to like Meatloaf and Joan Jett and Blue Oyster Cult and Utopia? Or No. No? <laughs> no. You, no, none of my kids uh, are, are, I mean, they like, they like music, but they're not musically inclined. Um, and my both my my daughters are teachers, school teachers, and my son is a, a is a computer technician. So, um, would I like them to be musicians? I don't know. Sure, if that's what they wanted to do, but uh, they were not impressed with my career. No, well, I am. So you know, <laughs> so let's talk about Adventures in Utopia. Sure, uh, that was like a concept album, and they said I read somewhere that it was supposed to be like a. a like a, based on a TV series. Well, you know, we wanted we wanted to to to, send, to kind of raise some eyebrows, and uh, and Todd was you know was very much into um, uh, you know what do, what can we do to you know to get some attention, and uh, it's it's kind of almost like the the if you build it they will come uh, theory. So if we said that we, you know, that we were going to do a television series, uh, and we had this idea for a television series about a band and about you know their their audience and about playing and uh, and the utopian lifestyle or whatever it was supposed to be, I'm not even sure it's been so long. Um, 
you know, we thought we would get some interest from uh, from maybe some TV executives, and they'd be willing to sit down and talk to us about developing a script or something like that. Um, unfortunately, that never happened. Well, there's YouTube now, so you never know. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, here we are 30 years later, you know. <laughs> um, the, I, I've read that a lot of the different members of the band all contributed and that it was a very democratic band. Yeah. Um, what was the whole recording process like and and i mean i love the songs uh you make me crazy and uh, i don't know is last of the new wave writers autobiographical as, as far as the band goes and well you know the the way that uh we would approach a record um and i did we did 10 records with me in the band maybe even 11 i'm not sure um was uh we'd we'd schedule a recording session and you know the three of us my uh there were besides Todd uh it was myself uh Roger Powell and Willie Wilcox uh we had a pretty high standard to live up to when it came to you know presenting a song for consideration for a record i mean we're you know we're coming to Todd who uh who had you know incredible success uh, as a solo artist uh, wrote, you know, numerous hit singles of his own, uh, produced uh, hit singles. Uh, so the benchmark was pretty high. And um, it, so it, it was, it, we would come into a recording session and Todd would already have, you know, a few songs already written. Um, and then it was a question of like, okay, well, who's got, you know, who's got another song? And, uh, and we, each individual uh, person submit uh, a tune, and then we'd all work on it together. So it was pretty democratic. Um, you know, we it, like any uh, like any uh, t- any team working together. Uh, we'd all you know contribute our, our our individual instrumental parts, and then have some say in the you know in the melodic uh, uh, section or the overdubs. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, it was it was pretty democratic. So I have to ask in. Shot in the dark. Mm-hmm. Who, whose idea was it to say that's what she said? <laughs> oh, that's. What, I mean, we. You know, I, we, I thought that was so funny. Said that. We always. That was. I mean, that's. That's that's been a a, a four word saying for God, who knows how long. I, I thought we, it was actually cool. I actually thought it was very cool. Yeah. You know, it, it's so like in George Harrison when he went, "It's true, it's true." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like one of those. Like little, I guess, like a little footnote in a song that, when you really hear it, it's actually hysterical and cool and you know edgy and fun all at the same time. That's a perfect. That song is a perfect example of uh, of a collaborative effort. I brought in the music to that song, completed, um, and Todd wrote the lyrics and melody. Wow! Um, when you when you mastered the this album and you heard it for the first time. What was your reaction? Not not from the you know you're actually sitting back and listening to it for the first time. What was that like? Adventures? Yeah. Um, I don't think we had time to think about it. We had to go right out on tour. Uh, we had to go right into rehearsals and take what what we had just recorded, turn it into a live show, and uh, and and play behind the record, promote the record. So we didn't really have any time to think about you know. Um, uh, to rest on our laurels or anything like that. We just we needed to get right out there and go. Um, I think we all knew that it was a good record. That it was uh, it was a record that we we made a conscious effort to uh, to write songs that were accessible to a larger audience than pre- previous records. Um, so uh, you know, in, in that respect, we. We knew that we had uh, that we had to get out there and, and start playing live shows behind it. I, I've always loved the album, and what, what, actually, one of the songs that I always liked was "Caravan." And uh-huh. I, I know there's a live version on it um, in one of your. Maybe it's the live in Japan album. Um, pro- probably. Yeah. I, I think that. Could you tell me a little bit about that song? Um, well, you know, everybody got their own songs on the record. I mean, Willie, uh, the drummer in the band was uh he got at least one song or two songs he was so he was the ringo of the band you know um <laughs> and and roger uh was a, a a fantastic songwriter um roger would get three songs on the record and that left uh five 
uh, or six, and uh, Todd would probably get you know the majority of those, and I'd and I'd be left with my three or four, you know, three maybe. I don't know. And Todd would get four, and I get three. Um, so that's how that you know th- that's how that wound. The caravan was just like okay, this is a Roger song, um, and it just so happened that caravan turned into uh, a, a jam song live. We didn't know prior to playing the song live whether or not, or, the, or I'm sorry, not whether or not, but that it was going to become such a, a staple in uh, in our live shows. Um, it just it, it it evolved into that. Did, did it? Does it surprise you that some of the fans really just love some songs? Like I'm a big fan of like the Icon. I just I I, I like that. I actually have played it on the station a whole pile of times. I played, you know, Set Me Free. I played The Road to Utopia. Mm-hmm. I, I use The Road to Utopia is like very inspirational to me. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, you lose your way and you discover a friend. Um, are you surprised by some of the, the songs that people just sort of, you know, really attach to? I'm always surprised by that because, uh, you know, as a songwriter, you, uh, you, you, you create something, uh, and then you think, wow, this is great. Oh man, this is so cool. Everybody's going to love this song. And then you write another song that's like, okay, well, this is an okay song. And then you put it out there and everybody gravitates to the song that you said, man, this is an okay song. <laughs> and the song that you thought was the best song ever written, nobody seems to want to hear. So it's um, it, it's it, it's it's a very strange thing. How how is songwriting how is songwriting changed for you all those years ago to now as a process? Oh, I I look at it as much more of a craft than I ever did. I I just uh, when I first started songwriting, it was just like stick this part here, stick that part there, uh, stick another chord change here. Uh, okay, let's go, you know rush through a lyric, and doesn't matter what the melody is in this part. We need a bridge over here. Uh, <clears throat> it was um, it was a lot uh, more of a crazy quilt process, a willy nilly, you know, just throw something everywhere. Now, <clears throat> it's really about crafting a song. It's really about sitting down and thinking, okay, well, I have this much of it written. Now, what is, what's the best way to complete this? What, does, what is this music telling me? What am I trying to, what, am I, what idea am I trying to get across? What, uh, what mood am I, am I going for? What mood does the, does the song t- put me in? Uh, it, yeah, it's much more of a of a, uh, a fine surgical. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's like you just want to be really careful about how you create. When when we talked a little bit before about listening to sort of adventures in Utopia when it was completed, and you didn't really have a lot of time. When you had the opportunity to sit down and listen pretty much straight through for three, mm-hmm. what was what what hit you? You know, it's, and it's always kind of odd to hear your own stuff. You know, uh, you know, I never listen to my own stuff. I, I, I I've been uh, through it uh, over and over and over again. I'll, I'll listen to it, you know, to something once or twice, and then I wish that I had made some changes here, or some changes there. Um, but I honestly, when I finished this record and I listened to it uh, from the start to finish, I was. I was incredibly proud of my work, <laughs> and I never, ever say that. I never do, and I would never say that in an interview either. I would be, I, I would be you know, sort of kind of um, humble to a fault, you know. It's, uh, I, I would rather not say that I like my own stuff than extol my own virtues. But I, 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 I feel totally and completely comfortable saying that this is the best work that I've ever done, and, uh, and it's a good record. So for me to sit down and, and put the record on and not skip any of the songs, man, that says, that says so much. And I'm, I'm just incredible. Like I said, I'm incredibly proud of it. And, and you should be because it's truly a great work of art. It really well, is. Well, you know, we, you only you do what you do. You know, uh, Sting said, uh, "You never really complete a record; you abandon it." <laughs> um, That's so, great. At, at a certain point, you know, there was there were things that maybe I wanted to do a little differently, or <clears throat> I thought I could change a 
little bit, but there came a point where I just said, you know what, this is this is great, this is good, and this is ready, uh, and I I threw it out there, and and the response has been really really positive. I've been extremely happy. So let's talk about Fade Away for a second. That was sure. that was sort of the song that you wrote in the liner notes. May not have actually made it. Speaking of abandonment, mm-hmm. how did it make the cut at the last second, as opposed to getting the sting abandonment thing? Uh, it made the cut by just a few days <laughs> um, because I had I had written the song uh, uh, without any m- melody or lyrics, and uh, I'd finished the track <clears throat> without. Uh, there was no piano on it when I finished. Uh, what, when I before I I actually finished it. Um, but the song was languishing for months, uh, and I just, for the life of me, could not come up with a melody and a lyric. Um, I, I, tr- I, I, I would sit in my uh, studio and just play the track over and over again and just say, waiting for, the, <laughs> waiting for the inspiration to come and just say, okay, this is what the song is. Uh, and I was... I was so uh, close to saying I have to I have to finish this record. It has to be done. The, you know, my fans want to hear it. Um, it's taking too long. Uh, maybe I need to to uh, to leave this song off the record. And then at the ninth hour, um, I came up with the lyric uh, "Fade Away," and um, and I'm very happy with it. Wow. Well, it's 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 truly a a, a beautiful album, and I think. Talking when you talked about all of the different people that participated and collaborated in the album, both from the fan level and from the, all the musicians and the, the you know the people who really helped, it, it truly shows a tremendous love and passion. I know that you said in an interview that music sort of helps define you, helped you find you who you were. I think that's expressed here, but could you kind of put a little fine point on that? I mean, it's, it's it's so obvious that you love music and that music truly is your essence. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, you, you know, I mean, without getting all kinds of mamby pamby spiritual on you, know, I just I firmly believe that um, I, people are put on earth to do certain things. You know, maybe somebody's going to be a fireman and somebody's going to be a police officer and somebody's going to be a stockbroker and somebody's going to be a school teacher. And I was put here to be a musician. And, uh, and it was up to me to, uh, to develop that, uh, that gift. Um, and, and, and to do, to, to let it flourish and to, and, and to help it, you know, um, I, the, 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 greatest compliment that I've ever gotten is when somebody comes up to me and says, your music means a lot to me. You know, um, I've listened to your music. It's helped me through some difficult times or it just makes me smile. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what, what I could ask more out of life than that. Well, I could actually say honestly, personally for me to you, that a lot of the music that you created and participated in has been extremely essential to my the entire soundtrack of my life. In fact, when I was pr- developing the show that we're actually on now, I actually thought about actually trying to get permission to use uh, "The Road to Utopia" mm-hmm. as my intro song. <laughs> I'm sure you could, you know. But I, I, I had friends who gave me another song that we, we didn't have to worry about copyrights and things like that. Right. But just the whole intro is like perfect for radio. But it was also just a song that I, I love since the time it, it, it was in my hands as a vinyl album. Yeah. And, and a lot of the work that you know, set me free, even though it may have been about a record company, at least to me it related to other things. Um, and it was special and important. And so I say to you, a lot of the music that you created really means a tremendous thing to me uh, personally. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. All right. We are out of time for now, uh, but there'll be more. Uh, this is Richard Solomon. This is Chasm Sultan. Real fast, ChasmSultan.com and on Twitter and Facebook. Chasm Sultan. All right, there you go. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. We may have some extra stuff on YouTube. Uh, we'll see you next week. What a-